21st century communications technology has given us the luxury of being able to connect instantly with anyone anywhere on the planet. Environmental stations in the frozen landscapes of the Antarctic can directly and instantly communicate their data to anywhere on the planet via satellite. GPS navigation systems allows us to travel to remote and unfamiliar locations with confidence. We are all globally connected to friends and family at all times with the smartphones we carry in our pockets. Our cars can park themselves in the tightest of spaces without collision and apply their own brakes when obstacles are detected in their path. We heat snacks in seconds in microwave ovens and expectant parents can see 3D images of their baby months before it's born. But few people realise or even consider as they instantly share videos of a sneezing panda cub to a dozen family members around the world that many of the conveniences of our modern world would not exist were it not for the invention of radio and its development in the wars that we have fought. Before we consider the advances in radio brought about by those wars and the benefits that they have brought to our modern world, it's important to address the genesis of radio and how, initially, it failed to impress those who would eventually come to rely on it. On the 13th of May, 1897, after building on the work of Alessandro Volta, André Marie Ampère, George Ohm and James Clark Maxwell, Guillermo Marconi sent the first wireless signal over open water from Flatholm Island in the Bristol Channel. The message, Can You Hear Me?, was sent using Morse code and was received 3.7 miles away at Lavernock Point in the Vale of Glamorgan in South Wales. The response came immediately. Yes, loud and clear. The demonstration of this new and, Marconi hoped, valuable technology was attended by officials from the post office, who were the regulators of radio communications in the UK until 2001. The war office was also in attendance, as was the Admiralty. And whilst naval commanders were impressed and keen to implement the new technology as a replacement for semaphore and the heliograph in ship-to-ship -ship communications, the army were considerably less impressed with Marconi's demonstration, citing fears that ether waves might ignite explosives. Also, the equipment needed to send the signal was very large and extremely heavy, with Marconi's 400 watt transmitter weighing an astonishing 300 pounds. Fitted aboard a navy vessel, weight was not an issue, but to a mobile land army, the problem, exploding ordnance aside, was obvious. Then, in 1904, came an important advance in early electronics and wireless engineering that heralded a trend that still has relevance today – miniaturization of technology. The English engineer and physicist John Ambrose Fleming, who had worked with Marconi on a successful transatlantic broadcast in 1901, invented the vacuum tube. This allowed much higher voltages to be accommodated and equipment was vastly reduced in size and weight. The technology was approaching something close to portable. The vacuum tube also gave the equipment a far greater electrical stability, allowing a radio to maintain a more consistent frequency. Even though Marconi's demonstration of a successful transatlantic wireless communication was initially hailed as a triumph of the age, the reliable transatlantic cable network that had carried messages between the US and Europe for 40 years was immune to atmospheric interference and the unpredictable effects of solar activity that wireless was proving susceptible to. The cables were also a high security network, whereas the wireless transmissions could be heard by anybody with a suitable receiver. Interest soon waned in official circles, but word was spreading about this new technology, and in hobbyist workshops around the UK, the USA and across Europe, radio amateurs, or amateur electricians as the early experimenters were known, were conducting their own experiments, often making early advances in wireless transmission equipment that would eventually allow radio to become a viable enterprise.
Need breeds necessity, and the necessity for any successful military campaign is good supply lines and reliable communications. And the gains made in the development of radio during the years of the First and Second World Wars have allowed us to enjoy many of the technological wonders of our own age. The wired telephone system, used to great effect in the smaller, more mobile campaigns of the later 19th century, proved less trustworthy in the embedded trench warfare of World War I, where tens of thousands of miles of wire was needed along the front lines to maintain communications over not just a few days or weeks, but often for years. Movement of gun carriages, exploding shells, enemy sabotage, or even a misplaced footstep could cause breaks in the wire which were almost impossible to locate and repair in the mud of the trenches. Breakdowns in communication were frequent, often causing confusion and greater loss of life. So with the recently developed, reasonably portable means for wireless communication now available, the Army's long-held resistance to adopting the technology fell away, and by 1916, the number of wireless radios in use along the British lines had risen from just four in 1914 to hundreds, all taking their place alongside the message runners, motorcycle couriers, carrier pigeons and heliographs. Amongst the first to adopt the technology were the cavalry. With their specialised saddle wireless, they were not only quickly deployed at high speed, but were now able to communicate information back to HQ instantly. The wired telephone still had its place, being a far more secure means of point-to-point -point communication, but the portable Morse code transmitter, developed by the engineering department of the post office, allowed orders to be received and reports to be sent directly from the field of battle. But think how often any of us uses a wired telephone today. To us, taking a cell phone from our pocket and calling friends and family, whatever they may be, is an action we don't even consider as unusual. Many of us don't even have landline phones in our homes anymore. But just consider the direct ancestor to our cell phones, to the cavalry soldier in the mud and squalor of the World War I trenches, being able to communicate directly from the battlefield would have seemed like an almost supernatural experience. And with wireless communications now established as a valuable tool in the arsenal of the military, advances came quickly. The British Navy's adoption of the wireless in the years before World War I had already allowed them to observe some unexpected but welcome effects of transmitted electromagnetic energy. With two listening stations offsetting the angle of their receiving antennas away from an incoming signal, they could each compare the drop in receiver gain and through triangulation, they could determine with good accuracy the position of the transmission's origin. This became known as wireless ranging and was a primitive equivalent to the later radar systems of World War II. At the start of World War I, Britain's Royal Flying Corps had been in existence for just two years. Airborne communications would be a huge benefit, but early experiments in fitting wireless transmitters into the small aircraft were desperately unsuccessful. The spark gap radios weighed as much as 75 pounds, and due to the low frequencies on which they transmitted, required up to 250 feet of wire to be trailed behind the aircraft when in flight. And even then, the signals have ranges of no more than a few miles. But by 1914, the small aircraft, fitted with the new vacuum tube transmitters, each weighing less than 14 pounds, and with the antennas crossed across the length of the wings and from nose to tail, airborne communications became more efficient, allowing the pilot to report on enemy troop movements and gun emplacements. But there were other problems for the pilots. They found it impossible to tune the wireless, send Morse with the left hand, and pilot the plane with the right, all at the same time. It became an imperative to be able to transmit voice. The problem was overcome by utilizing principles developed by a Brazilian priest, Father Roberto Landel de Moura, who, in June 1900, had succeeded in transmitting voice rather than Morse. But in an open cockpit, with the roar of an aircraft engine, and potentially with the sound of a machine gun firing, voice communication using established means was impossible. This necessitated the development of the radio headset and throat microphone. It was aboard these early planes that hands-free mobile communication was first used, and it's unlikely that a call center operator or online gamer today will give a second thought to the headset they wear, but it found its origins in the cockpits of British fighter planes over 100 years ago. In 1918, World War I finally drew to its bloody end, and many of the technologies that either developed or vastly improved radio technology now began to find their place in peacetime. 
Are portable communications and hand-free systems for the office and car now such an integral part of everyday life that we barely think twice about them came about from the necessity of gaining victory on the battlefields of Europe. As the world settled into peacetime, radio continued to develop. Amateur radio operators, forbidden by law from using their transmitters during wartime, once more began their operations. A new prosperity allowed even those with modest means to purchase a wireless receiver, and by 1920 there were many radio stations in the UK, the US and around the world broadcasting news, weather reports and music into people's homes. But the peace wasn't to last. Only 21 years later, in 1939, Europe was once more plunged into a devastating war. Today, if we want to know what the weather will be like, we turn on our DAB radios, satellite or cable TVs and tune into a weather report, or as most of us probably do these days, turn to the internet. Radar reports of cloud depth and rainfall are communicated quickly and accurately, allowing us to make or break our plans accordingly. This radar technology allows us to fly vast distances with high degrees of safety. Huge tankers can navigate the world's busiest shipping lanes in heavy fog, and even our cars will alert us if we find ourselves reversing too close to an obstacle. This technology came directly from the battlefields of World War II. In the late 19th century, the German scientist Heinrich Hertz had discovered that electromagnetic waves were reflected by solid objects. Though this technology was developed prior to World War II, the difficulties presented to the experimenters were that in order to achieve a usably accurate radar, super high frequencies needed to be transmitted at very high power. The breakthrough came with the magnetron. The first reasonably successful magnetron was developed in the Soviet Union in 1936 and allowed a 3 GHz frequency to be transmitted at 300 watts. Impressive, but improvements were needed. Then, in 1940, John Randall and Harry Boot at the University of Birmingham, England, invented a system using the multi-cavity magnetron that allowed them to transmit 3 GHz pulses at multi-kilowatt power. This allowed the detection of small objects such as single pilot planes to be detected and their distance ranged with much higher accuracy than the systems being used by their adversaries. This technology was installed along the south coast of the UK as part of the Chain Home Early Warning Radar System that gave long-range advance warning of incoming enemy bombers. The vacuum tube and magnetron systems developed by Randall and Boot also allowed for a low-powered, smaller version of the equipment that could be easily fitted into night fighter aircraft, anti-submarine aircraft and into the ships escorting the convoys bringing troops and vital supplies to the Allies. After the war, the magnetron was to find a place in homes across the world. It allowed the development of the microwave oven, which uses the super high frequency pulse of the magnetron to excite the molecules in food, causing it to heat up rapidly and cook our meals far quicker than the traditional gas or electric oven. The first commercially available microwave even tipped a nod to its origins when it was launched as the radar range. Another highly successful invention of World War II, which would not have been possible without advanced radio technology, was the guided missile. This development also had the biggest influence on the connectivity of the modern world, since the basis of the radio technology used in the missile system now allows telephone cell towers to handle hundreds of calls simultaneously. It has given us the principles used in early Wi-Fi applications and allows our Bluetooth devices to connect to each other. Most importantly, it allows us to connect to the internet. The invention of the guided missile also has a direct link to the glittering world of the golden age of Hollywood. During the 1930s and 40s, the Austrian-born actress Hedy Lamarr was adored by millions. But unbeknownst to those adoring fans, there was far more to the Hollywood star than her acting talent and beauty. Away from the public eye, she would work on complex engineering projects, developing a traffic light control system and streamlining the aerodynamicity of aeroplanes for Howard Hughes. But her greatest invention came from a desire to help the Allies defeat the Nazis. The Allies already had wireless torpedoes, but the Nazis possessed a technology capable of detecting the frequencies used to control their targeting, which they could easily jam, thus rendering the torpedoes useless. Working with her friend, the composer, George Antill, she invented spread spectrum technology. The system allowed a remote control to communicate with a torpedo while synchronizing the rapid switching of the control frequency. This rendered the Nazi technology useless, since by the time they'd identified one controlling frequency, it had already switched to another. 
Lamar and Antiel offered their patented technology to the US Navy, and although they initially considered the mechanism too bulky to be viable, the invention of the miniature transistor meant it was eventually used to great effect. During the Cuban Missile Crisis in October 1962, the entire US Navy blockade was equipped with missiles incorporating Hedy Lamar's design. The concept of spread frequency or frequency hopping is now used to control the switching systems in cell phone repeaters, home computers and Bluetooth capable devices. It's used in secure military communications, GPS, speech security systems, in fact pretty much anything that operates over a high speed wireless system incorporates the spread frequency technology first developed by Hedy Lamar in 1942. Throughout recorded history, war has been one of the most destructive pursuits of mankind but it has also been one of the most inventive periods. So, the next time you're gaming online, as you put on the headset, think of the World War I pilots for whom the system was developed. The next time you make a call from your mobile phone, consider the technology invented by a Hollywood beauty to thwart the Nazi torpedoes and save the lives of Allied troops. And when you throw a snack into the microwave oven, give a nod to the radar technicians of World War II, whose genius alerted the RAF to distant enemy bombers allowing countless lives to be saved. But never forget why we were driven to advance these fledgling technologies. The soldiers, separated from their units with a hostile force bearing down on them with no means to communicate their situation, stood little, if any, chance of survival. A navy ship, crippled by an enemy torpedo or having fallen victim to a mine, would sink with all hands lost. Without the means to alert allies to their plight, those surviving the initial destruction would surely fall victim to the water. Even today, death, suffering and devastating losses are inevitable in any war, especially amongst the protagonists who are often engaged in brutal confrontations against a hostile enemy. It is those losses and the desire to prevent more that drove the need for better, faster and more reliable methods of communication. They made the need for radar to become a powerful tool to alert the defending forces, allowing precious minutes to mobilize and launch their counter-defense. The darkest moments in our history have advanced our technology and in peacetime have given us many of the life-enhancing benefits we enjoy today. We should be thankful every day for the ultimate sacrifice given by those who suffered the pain of progress.